morning, everybody. Welcome to Live Board Game Breakfast. It is good to see you all. We, if you are watching this, I know that a few people were disappointed that breakfast is not earlier uh, in the day, but I don't want to do a live breakfast at 5 a.m. if that's okay with you all. Uh, but we're going to see. We're gonna, I'm not, again, not every breakfast will be live maybe on Mondays, but we're going to try to do a lot of them live. I think it's more fun to do interaction back and forth between different people. Okay, folks, so we have uh, somewhat of an info dump for you here, and we're going to start on that. We got good news, and unfortunately, we got bad news. First of all, good news. We're sponsored by Pandasaurus Games. And... Uh, to that end, we're talking about God Love Dinosaurs, but also Ohanami. I really raved about this card game earlier. We have three copies of this, a contest that you can win. Now, this is for folks in North America. Quick side note, some people said that we are, you know, anti the rest of the world, but every contest is different. The publishers pick where it goes, but also many times publishers don't have the rights to send out games all over the world. North America, all you have to do to enter this contest is to email us at contest at dicetower.com, put the word stocking in the subject line, and in the description to put your address, and by next week, we will pick three winners to get this. So, there you go. Hooray! Also, one week from today, the Winter Spectacular begins! Huzzah! I mean, we have games that we're going to be playing live, some exciting stuff to be playing, and over 20 I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Over 20 top 10 lists planned. You think we don't do enough top 10 lists? You won't say that after next week. In fact, you'll say, cool it on the top 10 lists. But uh, we're going to be obviously doing our top 10 of 2020 and our top 10 surprise of 2020. But more than that, you'll see the top 10 expansions and the top 10 uh, reprints and top 10 uh, art and things like that. But also, many of our contributors will be doing top 10 lists. And so you'll hopefully get a wide swath of things. And there you go. Bad news. Well, this is not a, a surprise to anyone, but we are officially canceling both Dice Tower West and Dice Tower Cruise in 2021. Um, yeah, I would have probably canceled these earlier, folks, but we are bound by a whole bunch of different things, and the cruise line just canceled. So let's talk about these briefly. First of all, um, I don't have exact dates for either one of those, but they will be in 2022, but it will be in the same time frame. Keep an eye out. We'll announce when that's happening. Secondly, if you... If you, let's talk about Dice Tower West first. If you paid for Dice Tower West, you are automatically switched over to the following year. You can ask for a refund if you want, but we're asking if you can to not do that because we lose money every time any transaction is made. And so uh, you just automatically put in for the next Dice Tower West. And of course, we'll have more information about that as time goes by over the coming years. So keep an eye out for uh, that. I would love to have done it, um, but unfortunately, Dice Tower West will be back bigger and better than ever before in 2022. Dice Tower Cruise, just uh, I, if you're not part of Dice Tower Cruise Facebook page, please join that. That's where more information we've put. There's, I'm not going to talk much more about that other than to say that we will be doing a cruise in 2022, and your credit for 2021 will be transferred over. Again, please don't call. In this case, don't call the cruise line and cancel your thing. Please contact us and we'll work that out because there's some more complications, obviously, with the cruise. We're working hard to make sure everything goes well in that uh, case. So, yeah, I, uh, you know, I wish we could have run both of those, uh, but we got to do what we can to keep people safe. Uh, Dice Tower East is still scheduled for July, and we're just going to have to wait and see to see if we can pull that one off. And will we run a Dice Tower Retreat later this year? Quite likely. But again, we're waiting to see how well the vaccine takes off and things like that. So we just go a month at a time. But we aren't stopping our online stuff. Our continual coverage of games and all things games will continue as times go by. Um, but even if you're, uh, I just know someone here said they're not part of Facebook, but you can always email us. You can email us at dicetowercruise at gmail.com and stuff. We'll keep in touch with that as much as you possibly can. So, um... All right, it is what it is, but hey, good news. We got a full show for you here, and we're going to start with a couple contributors right now. Hi, 
Hey, it's Stella. And Tarrant here. From Meeple University and the Dye Stella. Do you have a partner that likes to complain sometimes? Well, Tarrant here <laughs> complains a little bit about the box size. Yes, it's the worst thing about <laughs> Kickstarters in the modern <laughs> age is that the old, you know, it worked fine when all you had was publishers and they made every game in a foot by foot box that was that thick or in a um, foot by eight inch box and you could fit them on your shelves because they fit together perfectly. I just wish Kickstarters would uh, do the same and stop coming in every little box size and every big box size that don't tessellate together, don't fit in the shelves properly. Or maybe just, you know, get uh, a box size that all fits in calyx. I mean, this is also another argument. Do you like calyx? Do you like, or is it like not giving you flexibility to put different size of box? Yeah, I've never understood the, <laughs> the calyx thing because your standard box size leaves like that much gap. Mm. It doesn't, it makes it easier to take out mm. than like the Eagle Griffins that completely fill it up. But Oh yeah, that's perfect. It fits it up perfectly, but mm. then it's quite hard to mm. like, you know, pull it out. But the, <laughs> you know, the, I, I never liked that either. The, the, yeah. the 12 inch uh, box doesn't quite fill it up and then it, 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 it's not going to stack <laughs> perfectly vertically. They'll be off centered. And there's not aesthetic. There's also boxes that you know just don't quite close with the expansion. And That's true. Or with the um, with the card, um, the sleeves. So what happened to that? But anyways. Tell us your um, your problems as well. Uh, let us know in the comments. And we are Meeple University on YouTube and on the Dice Tower. Till next time. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. And today we are talking about photosynthesis, but with the expansion <laughs> under the moonlight. So photosynthesis <laughs> is all about sunlight growing these trees. This adds in moonlight. So there's three different modules that it adds in. Uh, the moon kind of casts this, 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 this moonlight, right? And the, uh, there's little animal meeples that are roaming around the board that are collecting these lunar points whenever they're around the moon. Then you can add in these moonstones that help kind of collect and refract that moonlight so that way uh, animals can get even more lunar points. And they have special abilities that they get to use when they you know, collect enough of uh, these lunar points. And then there's the big elder tree on the box, which can block the sun and the moonlight from happening, uh, which can really screw up your game. So those are the three things it adds. It's a whole lot of fun and it adds to the game in a really fun way. So all the animals are different. So there's eight different animals in the game and every player would play a different animal. So there's no repeats in it. And the nice thing about that is that some of the animals, just like the game of photosynthesis, are very mean. It still carries throughout. It's a mean game and the animals are mean. Not all of them, I just, I just jest. And no, but they are all cool, and I yeah. love, you know, the more you play, you can find more different strategies to use with each one that you play with. And uh, you find one that matches your personality, you can just play it a whole bunch, or you can, you know, take turns being different ones. So, I really enjoy playing with the beaver, I really yeah. excelled with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried when I heard the expansion, just because I thought photosynthesis by itself was, like, I don't know, I don't think perfect games exist necessarily, but it was so solid and smooth the way it was. And I needn't be worried because even though the expansion does add some complexity, that doesn't detract from the enjoyment I have from it. So I was able to enjoy it more with the expansion. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. It looks great on the table. I think photosynthesis, especially with the expansion, is very photographic. So photosynthesis. Photographic. Photographic. <laughs> well, everybody, if you want to hear more from us, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Bye. Bye, everybody. All righty. Well, uh, for a slightly different opinion, on the expansion for photosynthesis. I just posted my review last week. Um, but um, we want to say a huge congratulations to Stella there. Just got married. So congratulations, Stella and Tarrant, and also the Calyx's best bookshelf of all time. So whatever. Okay, so what I found on the internet. 
Now, this is probably too late for most of you, but I want to talk about the Secret Santas on Board Game Geek and other places, but Board Game Geek's the best, the biggest place to do them. If you go to Board Game Geek, you can find all sorts of Secret Santas. They have their big official one that you could have joined and that people are doing right now, but there are other smaller ones you can join. Every year, I join a Christmas card one, um, but Secret Santas in general, I think, are kind of a fun thing. In fact, um, I was involved with the foundation of this Secret Santa, I don't know, many years ago, um, which I thought was a lot of fun, and then it just got to be too much work for me to run it, and now Board Game Geek has it nice and automated and everything. Some people don't like the idea of Secret Santa because they say, just go buy yourself a gift you want. But the idea of sending something to other people and communicating with other people on some level is a lot of fun. I think uh, if, if you think about it, a white elephant or a Yankee swap or whatever you might call them, they are one of the worst ideas ever, right? Uh, but when you actually do them, they are a ton of fun. The games themselves are... Uh, a lot of fun to get and play, but when someone gives it to you, and there's also ways to personalize things and do it to just make it fun. There's something about getting a gift which is an exciting process. And if you really have the uh, ability, you might send it to somebody across the world or to a place where you don't live, and you have that option to kind of take our huge globe and just bring it a little bit closer for yourself. Christmas is uh, a little bit different for a lot of people this year. Many people, um, um, as a whole, Christmas gatherings are going to be smaller. Uh, you might even be by yourself. But using things like the Secret Santa at Board Game Geek and other places, you have that opportunity to kind of expand your world and help and work with other people. So, uh, again, the big one is already going, and it's probably too late to join it and such. But... Um, you could even start your own. There's ways, there's all kinds of different secret Santas that are out there, or you can do it next year. Either way, I hope you all are having a super great holiday season. And here are some more contributors. Hey guys, it's Nick back from Mental Health Minute, and I want to just talk about something funny. Board games can be funny. And I didn't really think of it for a while about why, how, if, or anything of that nature. I didn't think about it because why would it be funny? We're playing a board game. And games that you think are funny probably aren't funny to me. Some people think games like Galaxy Trucker or other games that are intentionally made to be funny are hilarious. While others are like, that's not funny. That's not funny. Then games that are not meant to be funny in any way are hilarious. This game is hilarious. Why is Trains hilarious? Just, I, I, I uh, play the game and you see that it's just, it, it's so funny and it's so good because of that. I love games like that. I love games that are unintentionally funny, not because they're bad, not because there are jokes in them, not because they're a game I would never play. It's because just when you're playing, you're like, I'm playing a game about trains with a deck. I don't understand why this is a thing, but it's great and it's hilarious. Do you have a game that you love that you just think is funny and there's just no real rhyme or reason to believe that it's funny? Let me know in the comments below because we all need a little bit of laughter nowadays. Do enjoy your breakfast. Hey there everyone, it's Jen the Board Game Librarian flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with my segment from page to the table where I pair a book and a board game together, do some library magic and make them share a common theme. I'm not even going to try to hoist this big baddie up on the table in my normal review because it weighs a ton. and. Yeah, so you already know that I'm doing Sentinels of the Multiverse, if you're familiar with this big, huge black box here. Um, but what book am I going to do with it this week? That's a magical surprise. Umbrella Academy, Apocalypse Suite. So 
And this is um, the first book in Umbrella Academy graphic novels, comic books. This is Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba. Um, so in, in Umbrella Academy, if you're not familiar with the Netflix show, uh, we have seven um, extraordinary children that are all born on the same day and they have gifts, magical abilities and power, superhuman strength, um, the ability to rumor someone. I heard a rumor. Um, the ability to speak to the dead and they are all banding together to beat a baddie. And in this particular one, I they are banding together to defeat a baddie that is pretty close to them. I picked Sentinels of the Multiverse because the variety of superheroes that are going on in here really reminded me of Sentinels of the Multiverse. Um, a cooperative card game where you are working together to defeat a baddie um, with different environments and different abilities. Um, a very diverse uh, cast of superhero heroes and characters. Um, but Sentinels is a card game where you are playing cards and um, performing actions off of those cards. Very easy gameplay. Um, that is all. Happy breakfast. You know, that Sentinel's big box is humongous. We haven't diced our library, and I don't know that anyone has ever pulled it out because it's just so intimidating and you actually have to lug it across the room. Uh, it, it's almost an example of, of something becoming too big. I like Sentinels in the Multiverse a lot. I think they could have made a box the size of Twilight Imperium or smaller and still fit in a good chunk of the stuff. But, all right. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? So this week's going to be a little bit different. So first of all, I'm going to let you in on a secret that we've never told anybody, um, sort of. That. So we've been doing these reviews called the Four Squares. And uh, that does not necessarily mean the same four people will be there. It will be four people, but it might be different. I mention that because that's going to happen this week. Because we're going to actually have two Four Square reviews this week. We're going to do Four Square reviews of Dwellings of Eldervale. And we're going to be doing a review of the new brand new expansion for Twilight Imperium 4. So keep an eye out for that and we're going to be we're going to be probably upping the amount of four square reviews as we move into 2021 and so on you'll see more of them probably but again not necessarily the same four people each time. Um, so that's coming this week. Let's see. We're also have tomorrow a live play of Vanguard. Vanguard's launching next week from Awakened Realms and so we'll be playing it a week early this pretty hefty style space exploration style game so tune in tomorrow at noon to see us playing that and this week I'm going to be going through uh, if you've been following along I've been doing the 10,000 and below series where I take games that are ranked 10,000 or lower on board game geek it's time to finish that off and I'm gonna be doing that this week by going through the 2,000 worst games of all time so that's gonna be a six-part series and we doing it live each time so you'll be able to come in and chat with me live as we take a look at the worst of the worst of the worst and each one don't watch part one if you want to see the worst games that's gonna be part six each one we're going to get lower and lower and lower. So that's what's coming from Dice Tower this week. Of course, we got other things uh, coming on when this show is finished. At 11 later on today, Z will be doing a uh, What's Happening. And then at noon, I'll be back with my Q&A. Uh, podcast going up tomorrow. Eric is back. So Eric and I will be putting, uh, we have a podcast going up, the Dice Tower podcast. And there's lots of different things going on in Dice Tower this week. Some, a werewolf game or two also. So stay tuned. And, of course, the Winter Spectacular, one week from today. And that's what's coming from the Dice Tower this week. Folks, as a parent, there are so many precious moments we get to witness in our children's lives that we should truly cherish. But there's one above all others that just fills me with an unbelievable joy. <laughs> And so today we're taking a look at When I Dream, a hidden role party game where each person will have one turn being the dreamer. So where is the dreamer is going to put on the dream mask and everyone else is going to be giving that person a one word clue about the revealed word. 
The catch is that some of these people are fairies. They want the dreamer to guess the correct word on the card. Others are boogeymen. They want the dreamer to guess incorrectly. Also, some people are going to be sandmen who ideally want the dreamer to guess the same amount of right and wrong answers. The number one thing about this game is the artwork for sure. And what's great about this is you actually have 20 different artists that are featured in this game. There's 110 cards that are double-sided, so you get 220 unique pieces of artwork with this game. For our high five here, we're gonna take a look at five of these cards. First of all, we've got the coffee train, which basically describes my everyday uh, routine right now. Lots of coffee, watching train videos with the toddler. Uh, we've also got the donkey jam. This must be the donkey juice that Z is always talking about. Uh, we've got zombie snail, which if I'm being honest, zombies are already kind of slow. So a zombie snail, I'm pretty sure I can get away from them. Uh, we also got the uh, the baker die here, which I think used to be Tom's profile picture somewhere. I don't know. And then the faucet museum, looked it up, real place, Bonacore. You know where it is? Italy. Check it out. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care and sweet dreams. This is a segment where we take a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms fit together and what's a game you should try out. Today we're looking at Christmas Story, which is based on the famous Christmas movie. Let's take a look and see how it plays, and I'll come back and tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match. A Christmas Story, a major card game, is a deduction game where you're trying to find the BB gun and the decoder, know where they're at, without having any bullies in front of you. Oops, I have a bully here, so I would lose the game. On your turn, I can swap with a card in the center, look at it, now I have this information, and put a peak token on it. I can also dare somebody to look at theirs on my turn, and we can swap cards. If they accept my dare, I can look at the card given to me, and I can put a token on it. Now, I don't have to have the decoder BB gun in front of me, I just need to know where they're at and not have any bullies in front of me. If I feel like I know that information, I can then say, I want to unwrap the present, verify I know where these are at without showing anybody, and then show everybody the cards in front of me. It's not a bully. I would have won, and show them where the decoder is. If I dared somebody for a card, let me swap this card with this card, and they had said no, then I would get the leg lamp, and they would have to turn one of their cards over face up, giving everybody information. The leg lamp gives me a power. I can triple dog dare somebody which means I can make a trade and they can't say no. If somebody dares me, I don't have to turn a card over if I refuse, or I can peek out one of the cards here, and now I have that information in front of me. The first person to find the BB gun, the decoder, without having any bullies in front of them, is the winner of the game. The IP doesn't match the game very well. I feel like it'd be really hard to take this movie and make a game that's coherent on it. Instead, you're trying to find the gifts that you want out of these presents, and while the IP doesn't fit very well with the mechanisms of what's going on, I do feel like this is a very solid entry-level deduction game that families and non-gamers and children are really going to enjoy. So while I feel like the IP is mediocre at best, and it does work to some extent, has unique artwork, etc. on it, I do feel like it's a very solid deduction game which pulls it up just a little bit. So in that regard, I can recommend this game to you, but on the IP scale, it doesn't hit this target exactly. It does shoot its eye out. All right, uh, slight difference of opinion here. That game is terrible. Um, and that's French. Um, but I love that movie. And I just played that game literally yesterday, and hmm, I'll talk about it later. Don't worry. Okay. Um, all right. So I am stealing from the future here. So I want to talk a little bit about something that uh, we are actually going to be posting in our podcast. So it's from the past, but the future. Anyway, someone asked a question on a podcast, which I thought was a really good question. So we answer it there, but I'd like to talk about it a little bit here on Board Game Breakfast. So many games come with asymmetrical powers. You get an asymmetrical power, and that asymmetrical power gives you, many times, it gives you a style of play. A good example of this is Marco Polo, or the Voyages of Marco Polo. You get these massive powers, and it's like, all right, well, this power gives me benefits when I'm traveling on the map. I really should travel on the map, or you get, you know, whatever the game is, the, the power that you get gives you kind of a direction. So what do you do, though, when you get that power and it's not the way you'd like to play? Maybe it's the kind of power that really promotes you attacking somebody else. 
and you're not a very antagonistic person uh, or aggressive player. Or maybe it's a power that requires, like for me, sometimes power is like, well, this is one where you need to hurt yourself to do better in the game. I don't like that sort of thing. And so I, I feel like there's a couple solutions for this. One is that uh, get over it. Uh, I'm not saying this is the, the right one, but you know, hey, you got a, a power for a style that you don't particularly like playing, um, then uh, just learn to play that way. And I've done that before. I've gotten some powers or an asymmetrical ability, and I'm like, ah, this is just not my style. Well, you got to lean into it. Well, because I guess there's actually another option. You can just ignore your power and do what, you know, play your game normally, but then you're giving up that advantage. <laughs> That's just crazy. Um, so you, you, I've leaned into these in the past where I'm like, I don't really like that style. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes I go, ah, I actually like playing this way. What do you know? Like Hearthstone, for example, uh, collectible uh, digital card game. I don't particularly like playing some decks, but there were some cards and things I tried them out, and I thought, huh, I don't really like I thought I wouldn't like that, but I did. I, I didn't like the priest in this game can heal themselves and you heal your hero self. And I got some cards that benefited you when you healed yourself. And I thought, I don't really like the healing myself. I just want to deal damage to my opponent. I don't care if I have one hit point. I just want to hurt them. And I was like, oh, I'll try this priest thing out. And I really liked it. It's a really great thing. The third option is, in these cases, you can give everybody two powers and then they pick one. I doubt you'll get two you dislike. Uh, when that happens, I'll get two and I'm like, oh, I don't like this one at all. I'll play with this one. I may not be one I love, but at least I'm not playing the one I dislike. And if a game has that, then that's the best way i found, is to deal everybody two. Uh, I'm not a big fan. When a game says give powers at the people randomly, I normally don't like doing that for the reason I just mentioned, with the exception of maybe a game like Twilight Imperium, where the powers are so well known and the player has a very specific strategy style, I don't necessarily want them getting that one. But I usually I just like to give out a couple powers to everybody and you pick your favorite. What do you think? You know, I like games that have these uh, powers because they give you that focus, hey, this is the strategy you, you should be doing. I think that's fun and in fact, sometimes, I think it's almost a disadvantage to not play with them. A really good example of this is Terraforming Mars. Uh, Terraforming Mars has a basic corporation that you can play with, or it has advanced corporations. And I, I'm still a little mind boggled that the advanced corporations isn't in the basic game. Because when you give someone an advanced corporation, it gives them some idea of what they should be doing. The basic corporation, you can do anything. And Advanced Corporation says, hey, your, your steel is that worth extra. And that just kind of gives you kind of a focus. And I think that that's a fantastic thing. So um, someone here in the comments says they dislike when gamers, games make you do certain things. You have less choice. I can see that. Like, oh, and my ability is to get steel. Like I just mentioned Terraforming Mars. Well, I guess that's what I have to do. I get that, but I still think a good game will point you in a direction, but still leave you with a framework of different things that you can do. So, there you go. Not my style? Tell me what you think in the comments. Let's keep going. What is up? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week I want to talk about Shadow of War, the video game. That is a Lord of the Rings styled video game that takes place during the 60 years between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And you are playing uh, as one of the characters who's name escapes me, uh, but you are going off trying to tear down strongholds, siege them. Uh, it, it's like this big war style game, uh, but you're going off in different battles. There's a whole bunch of different side quests. There's adventure and everything, and it is super awesome and very thematic. It's very, very cool. Love that game. I want to connect that to War of the Ring. War of the Ring is a beast of a board game. It, it, it takes place during the actual Lord of the Rings era, and you're playing as either the Fellowship or as the uh, Shadow player, I guess. And you have, um, you're trying to siege strongholds just like in Shadow of War. Uh, it's this large war scale sized um, game, and you are going through, and what I like a lot about this game are the event cards and the different characters that you're playing as. And uh, for the Fellowship, when your characters, when they die, they're actually dead. Like, you don't just get those uh, army uh, players back or anything like that 
unlike the Shadow Player, which stays really true to the theme. Uh, this game is oozing with theme, just like Shadow of War, I feel, is. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you could check out mine and my brother's channel called Room 51. I'll catch you next time. Hey there, Breakfast fans. My name is Dave here at Game Vine, and today I wanted to do a smash up where we take pieces that make the game aesthetically pleasing, but the pieces that actually get handled, I wanted to change those. Duct tape of smash up videos is HeroScape. It pretty much, you can take this game and smash it up with anything. So I'm smashing it up with Castle Panic, and I'm going to be making it aesthetically pleasing. Let's go. Okay, so this is what it looks like smashed up. Can you even see the original walls and towers? You can't. Well, my angle's terrible. But, I mean, look at this. What a improvement. Now, the way that I would say do this is with the HeroScape tiles here, you can take off the top. I would say that would be the first hit point or the wall. And then, when you get hit, the tower gets hit, you just take this part off. And then you are susceptible to getting attacked by the goblins. And this box even comes with something to replace the barracks for the wall here. So normally you would just put it over like this. Well, this set, the Hero Escape set, comes with ladders. So you can just put the ladders like this and now, boom, you got barracks. Okay, so the next mashup is Ink and Gold and Diamant. I don't have Diamant, but what you do is just take the pieces from Diamant and smash them up with Ink and Gold. Really simple. But I did something a little different, and I have a video on my channel displaying this, so if you want to take a further look, you can. But let's get down and show you what I did with this chest. So now you see them. Now you don't. So of course, I made a trap door. I know this is going overboard, but I really like it, and it makes ink and gold all the better for me. And that is all the smash ups I have for you today, folks. Let me know some of the combinations of smash ups that you've thought of in the comments below. But until next time, I'm Dave from Gamevine, and I'm out. Just as a heads up, folks, Ink and Gold and Diamant are the same game. <laughs> I want those treasure chests, by the way, uh, for the Dice Tower Library. Um, but the all, the HeroScape idea is a good one. My only concern with that one is is the I don't, if anyone owns those castle pieces, and I own like ten sets of that, um, they're fairly difficult to get apart. I've actually used a hammer to get them apart in times past because it's that much of a problem. All right, folks. Today we're taking a look at the 2021 calendar from Board Game Art Creations. This is not the first time I've talked about uh, Katya and her stuff. In fact, if you notice on my Q and A's, the intro is her. She uses board game pieces to make pictures, and it's fantastic. So I just got the calendar. I backed the Kickstarter and thought I would show it off here. Um, some of the pictures involved in the calendar. So let's see here. We got. Tang Garden. That's pretty cool. That picture's better than the game. I jest, I jest. I know some of you love the game. All right. Um, this one here is Santorini. Oh, love Santorini. Uh, there's a Wingspan Blue Jay. Of course, if you hadn't told me it was Wingspan, I wouldn't know <laughs> it's a Blue Jay. Um, this one here is Tricarion, their most acclaimed title. Is it their most acclaimed title? I thought it was an acronym, but eh, what do I know? Here's a Viking from Raiders of the North Sea. This one I really like. It's a good, it's a good looking thing. And when you look closely, it's made of meeples. Uh, this is uh, from one of the uh, games from Board and Dice. And uh, this one here is from Valeria Card Kingdoms, a dragon there. This is, this is a cool space one from Tiny Epic Galaxies. This is bigger than the game. This one here is the Hall of the Mountain King. Which is pretty cool. Cool looking game, too. Uh, werewolf here, but it's actually Folklore the Affliction, but a werewolf from that. This one's a good one. Put that one up on your wall on Halloween. Here we have one from Onitama. I don't think the pieces are from Onitama. And uh, this one's from Terraforming Mars. That's better than every single piece of artwork in the game Terraforming Mars. Uh, this one here is from Endangered. And then, of course, we have a 10 by 10 challenge, which I'll never follow, but some people like it. That's where you play, pick 10 games, and you play them over the course of a year. She also had magnets here. Um, and uh, 
I like these magnets a lot. They're the same pictures and stuff, but they just go up in the fridge, and I just think that's a neat thing to have. Anyway, this is from Board Game Art Creations. Uh, you can find her on Instagram and on Facebook. I highly, highly recommend this. It's fantastic. Um, calendars are not as used as they used to be, considering how much electronic calendars we have, but I still like to have them up on the wall, if nothing for the pictures. And I'll say this is the best with all due respect to all the, everyone else who does them, this is my favorite of all the board game calendars that are out there. All right, more contributors. Hey, thanks for joining me for another Grant's Game Rex. Today, I want to recommend the awesome new game, Kingswood. This is a great intro to worker placement game. There's strategy, but it's not going to break your brain. In heavier worker placement games, if somebody goes to where you were just about to go, it makes your entire world fall apart. You're like, oh no, that's where I was gonna go. You've ruined everything. What am I supposed to do now? Oh boy, everybody pause for like five minutes while I could figure out a completely new strategy here. But in Kingswood, if someone goes to where you were just about to go, you're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, then I'm just gonna go over here instead. Good luck to you. In Kingswood, you are moving workers from one location to another. You get the rewards at the location where the worker started and the location where the worker ended. If you move a worker into the forest, you can use accumulated resources to fight monsters. First person to 20 fame tokens wins the favor of the king. This is a great game for people who are in relationships because it's full of hearts. It's also a great game for people who are single because it's full of swords. Hey everyone, today on the Plastic Canvas we're turning the Red Guard from Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion from this into this in just two minutes. Hey everyone, Maddie from the Plastic Canvas, and today on Two Minute Mini we're painting the Red Guard from Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now for a while now I've been meaning to have a go at doing some NMM or non-metallic metal, so painting a surface to look as though it's made of metal without actually using any metallic paints. And the reason for that is because my go-to way of painting coloured armour has always been to take my silver metallic, mix in the colour that I need, paint that on, do some battle damage, some inconsistent highlighting along the edge to make it look a bit beaten and worn, and for tabletop standard that's always done a pretty good job. But the problem with that though is that the metallic paints always give more of a glittery kind of sparkly effect rather than the true reflection style that you get from actual metal. So when I saw the artwork for the Red Guard here, I knew that I wanted to have a go at finally doing some NMM. And while the standard that I was able to do it to doesn't even hold a candle to those that can do it really well, for my very, very first go at it, I was really, really happy with how it came up. This is definitely a very, very tricky technique to do because some of the difficulties that I found was just getting the reflections in the correct spot because we're sort of unconsciously really familiar with how metal does reflect light. If it's not in the right spot, our eye sort of naturally knows that there's something not quite right about it. So it did actually take a little bit to be able to get the reflections in the, in the correct spot. And then also just having those correct transitions from the shadows through to the reflections. I found that I put Put a bit too much white in. I covered a bit too much area with white and that meant that I wasn't able to get the transitions quite right from the darker shadows through to the brightest reflections. But once I worked that out, I then started to cover more area with orange, which was that mid-tone of the reflections, and then less area with the white and that definitely seemed to help. But if you'd like to see the full version of this video where I go through the stages in more in-depth, you can head over to my channel, The Plastic Canvas, and I hope you enjoy your breakfast. That always makes me sad to see people who can, <laughs> it's just a skill I do not have. Amazing painting there. Well, alrighty folks. Well, that is the end of a live board game breakfast. So a couple things. First of all, come back at 11 o'clock for Z with What's Happening, playing an app. And then at noon, I'll be doing Q&A and something else. You'll see. Um, and so then, of course, we got stuff going up all week long. 
One week from now, Winter Spectacular, we have a contest. If you're just joining out, you're like, what's the contest? Uh, how do I enter the contest? Here's the cool thing about YouTube. You can go back and look at the beginning of the video. <laughs> I always see people like, I don't know what to do. The rewind function works. This ain't Twitch. So um, thank you all, though, for watching. Thank you all my fantastic contributors. We'll be doing another live board game breakfast on Thursday, as always, with Mr. Bonacore and Mr. Garcia. So uh, we'll see you all then. Until next time, though. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast Live on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.